our last speaker is uh, the man who's always our last speaker at American Renaissance Conference, uh, Sam Dixon. Sam is the son of a Presbyterian minister, as I am. Uh, all of his ancestors were uh, sons of uh, the Confederacy, as were mine. Uh, all of his male ancestors fought honorably for the Confederacy. Uh, unfortunately, I, I had a shirker. But uh, uh, Sam Dixon attended the University of Georgia, where he was a state college director for the Young Republican F Federation. It's a mistake he now deeply regrets. Uh, he graduated from the University of Georgia Law School in 1972, and he has lent his legal talents to many causes on our side. And it's, in fact, for his activities of that kind that uh, one of these self-style watchdog groups has said that uh, Quote, Dixon and his ilk should be regarded and treated as terrorists. That's uh, kind of pot calling the kettle black, it seems to me. But uh, I suppose they'd like to see him held indefinitely in Guantanamo. But as I say, since the very first American Renaissance Conference, it has been Sam who has brought the proceedings to a close. And it's with much gratitude and admiration that I introduced you to my friend and colleague, Sam Dixon. It's always an honor to be in the company of Jared Taylor. Uh, and as usual, I think we should take this opportunity at the close of our meeting to thank Jared uh, for the decades of dedicated work that he has brought to the liberation of our people and to all others who work to make this convention possible. So I would ask we give a round of applause to Mr. <laughs> Taylor. American Renaissance is one of the few organizations uh, that is not, is not a heritage organization. Uh, there are all kinds of heritage organizations. There are thousands and thousands of heritage organizations. There's the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Ladies Association that preserves Mount Vernon. Uh, there are societies to preserve uh, old churches and Victorian architecture and Confederate war monuments. Uh, the list could go on and on and on of the thousands of organizations that exist to, to protect uh, and to maintain the heritage of white people. Uh, American Renaissance is one of the very few that is concerned about the future and destiny of white people, which to rational, thoughtful people is a much more important thing uh, than our heritage, as important as that heritage is. Uh, the past is very important to us. It's our collective memory. It is our inspiration. It is the standard uh, that was set up by our ancestors to which we must live. But it is not as important as the future of the children of this generation and the future of our race over the coming millennia. Years ago, uh, Hans Christian Andersen wrote a story that is often quoted. It's, it's been quoted here often, uh, and it's quoted throughout uh, the Western world as an example uh, of social hypocrisy, to ridicule social hypocrisy, uh, and uh, it's called The Emperor's New Clothes. And all of you have heard the story of The Emperor's New Clothes, but it bears repeating here and for us to think about it. Uh, the emperor is approached by two swindlers who are tailors, not our tailor, but clothes tailors. These swindlers tell the uh, emperor that they, have, they can cut and devise magical clothing that is so beautiful, that's the most beautiful clothing imaginable, but it cannot be seen. Uh, it has a magic property, and that is that it cannot be seen by inferior people who do not deserve the position in society that they hold. Uh, and so the emperor says he would like to have this, and he, he places an order with them, and the swindlers come back, and of course they have no clothes. Uh, but they show it to the emperor, who doesn't want to reveal that he is unworthy of being emperor. So he, he puts on the clothing and walks around with no clothes on. Uh, and the courtiers and the people in society, the people in the street, all exclaim how beautiful the emperor's clothes are because they don't want to show that they are unworthy of the positions they hold in society. And then, as you remember, 
A child looks at him and says, but the emperor has no clothes. Now, Hans Christian Andersen, living in a better age, the uh, 1840s, when white people were still sane, and when we were expanding, and we were confident and full of uh, certitude, he gave his story an optimistic ending, in which the scales fall from everyone's eyes, and pretense ends, and uh, the emperor's embarrassed, and the swindlers are exposed, and everyone sees that the emperor has no clothes. Now, if the story were written today, it would have a different ending. Uh, what would happen is that the child would be, be taken away by the Department of Family and Children's Services uh, to be turned over to therapists and counselors provided by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, and the, the parents would be prosecuted and jailed for having reared a child uh, who would dare to do such a thing. Uh, the, Hillary Clinton would issue a statement saying that all decent people all over the world are appalled at what the child has done. And Mark Potok would appear on NPR with Michelle uh, Norris uh, and be interviewed about how the child and his parents have been added to the list of haters that have been identified by the Southern Poverty Law Center. This is a metaphor for what has happened with, for, to American Renaissance. Uh, American Renaissance, like the child who says, but the emperor has no clothes, is not pointing out something exotic. We are pointing out facts, statistics, observations that, that a child can see. Those of us who hold our views don't have to resort to elaborate scientific evidence, although it's certainly wonderful that we have, that we can prove our case scientifically. But a child should be able to look and see what the effects of multiculturalism and race mixing uh, have been in Europe and in our own country. The failure of this program, as I, I said the first time I spoke at an American Renaissance Conference in the 1990s, the failure of these programs is obvious. Uh, there is no statistical data to show that mixing the races has produced any increase in black academic performance, and it, it, beyond the, the mere slightest amount. Uh, I often point this out to, to people who are deeply committed to the race-mixing uh, anti-white cause, and, and they reply, they, they receive this with just consternation and contempt, that this cannot possibly be true. But common, I point out to them that common sense tells you that if studies existed, if data existed that showed that dramatic improvements, we would hear about it. If there were studies that showed that as a result of busing children in Charlotte, North Carolina, that black SAT scores jumped 100 points and black IQ scores jumped five points, uh, we would hear about it. Dan Rather would have told us about it. Uh, you know, Barack Obama would tell us about it. Uh, the people doing the studies would be given Nobel Prizes. Uh, the fact that we don't hear about it shows that what I am saying, what we say, is true that we have spent three generations now on uh, a second noble experiment that has been a complete and total failure in terms of bringing any benefit to our society and has brought only negative things at great cost. The Detroit uh, is an example of the emperor's new clothes. You look at Detroit, you see what the program has brought about. Uh, you look at Newark, you look at other downtown areas of America, uh, you look at the flight from the schools, the collapse of educational standards, the rise of crime. Uh, all of these things uh, are the results of the second noble experiment, as I like to call it. Uh, Herbert Hoover characterized prohibition as the noble experiment, but it took only about 13 years for the American people to decide uh, in those more sensible, educated times, the 1920s and 30s, that prohibition, which had demonstrable <coughs> beneficial effects, uh, was not worth the price in terms of organized crime and corruption that it brought with it. Uh, three generations have passed as we have been on the road to nowhere, uh, and there is no sign that the establishment uh, or the people who are and the people who are committed to these programs uh, are prepared to reconsider one whit uh, the program they have embarked upon. It is remarkable also that 
the liberals have stolen. I, I don't like to use the word liberal, as I will explain in a minute. I, I, I have a lot of liberal feelings myself, and I characterize myself as a racial communitarian, uh, communitarianism being a rather leftist liberal movement. But the, 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 uh, one of the strange features of the society we live in is that the, the multiculturalists, the liberals who, who are going along with the emperor and, and admiring the emperor's new clothes, not only do they get the benefits of conformity, they have often also stolen the crown of martyrdom. Uh, you, if you read the blurbs on the jackets of, of liberal novels about things like uh, race mixing, uh, women, black well, man marrying white woman, things like this, uh, one thing jumps out at you, and if you read the New York Times book review section, it, it, you can count on it almost every week that some, some liberal will be accorded an accolade of the bravery with which he wrote some book on Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, the, the courage it took uh, to stand up to Rush Limbaugh. They're, they're always, liberals are martyrs, and they give each other awards at conventions for their martyrdom. So you can be a martyr and be honored. There, it's unprecedented in history. You, you have successful martyrs. It's like Torquemada uh, being given an award for being a martyr, uh, for having, having burned all these people at the stake. It, it's something that, that we've never seen before. We, we see, as I mentioned before, that facts don't matter to these people. In fact, I think they feel that facts are really fascist anyway, uh, and they sometimes expressly state that they're opposed to the white male European construct of, of neutrality and scientific laws. Uh, they, they actually come out and say that. In, in law, they come out and say that they don't want the legal, uh, legal studies movement, uh, which is very fashionable in law schools today, says that what matters is the result, not neutral application of laws and rules. That the rules of evidence should be uh, adopted and implemented according to how it helps a case in front of the court. Well, facts don't matter to them. If they see a carrot growing in a cabbage patch, well, the carrot is a cabbage. And that's all there is to it. If a Somali uh, comes over here and gets off the plane, he's an American. He's as American as Nathan Hale and Paul Revere. Uh, that that he's, he's in America, therefore he's an American. Uh, they seem to have the idea that if you replace our population here with a third world population, we will remain a first world nation. Somehow there is some mystical magic in the turf, in the soil of America, that will turn these people with a millennia of proven inability to have a civilization, that it will turn them into Swedes and Norwegians. Uh, I think this is beginning to break a little bit. When I was a child uh, in the, the age of the Kennedys, uh, that really, I think liberals had the idea that with the Peace Corps and a few more uh, government programs, that they would turn Uganda into Norway. Uh, and they, they, I think some of them are beginning to realize that it, it just quite isn't working. Uh, and we have to hope and work with those to, to deprogram liberals. One of the things that we need to do is to deprogram these white people that are in the grips of this ideology. Unlike the multiculturalists, we believe that a carrot remains a carrot, uh, even if it's growing among cabbages. Um, we are not in the grips of an ideology the way our enemies are. I want to talk about the white problem, and then I want to talk about the solution. As we have all heard many, many times, the real problem we face is not a black problem. Uh, it is a white problem. Uh, the problem begins at home, begins with us. Uh, because we are the only unnatural group of people on earth. Every other race, every other ethnic group uh, acts normally. They take their interest uh, and then they, they seek what is good for their race. One thing that the neo-abolitionists uh, and people like the ones who edit the uh, magazine Race Trader uh, like to say is that only whites can be racist. Uh, I know that uh, Jared Taylor has often quoted these statements. That only whites can be racist, and therefore whites can never complain about discrimination directed against them. Well, actually, the truth is that only whites can be liberals. None of these other groups are liberals. When they seek their own interest, when the Chinese seek uh, more Chinese immigration, 
uh, when the uh, Mexicans seek legalization for the Mexicans here, when the blacks seek more quotas, none of these groups are liberals. They're, they're simply in it for the gimme. Uh, they're, they're in it for what's, what's good for them. They're looking out for number one. So contrary to what our enemies say, it isn't true that only whites can be racist. Why, the whites are the only group who can't be racist. They're the only people who can be liberals. It is extraordinary that whites rejoice in, in, in a, a suicidal form of objectivity. They, uh, they, they like to be objective about their own race, or supposedly objective. Actually, when you study them, you know they're not objective. They, they apply standards to us that they would never apply to other people. Uh, they're, they demonize their own race. Uh, it's kind of a subconscious uh, recasting of white supremacy in which whites become the demon factor uh, in the world and only whites are capable of evil things uh, and other people are these naive um, Candides, Rousseau's uh, noble savages. Well, what about objectivity? Uh, some years ago I heard Jared Taylor talking and he, he, he made me a talk and he said that it was about why we honor the, uh, our Confederate ancestors. And he said that we honor them because they are our own. And I thought that was kind of weak, quite frankly. Uh, but now uh, I, I come to agree uh, that objectivity uh, is a very sick thing. Uh, you cannot be objective about your own survival. The choice of life over death uh, is, is not an objective choice. You, you have to be subjective about your own life and put it ahead of the lives of the microbes that the antibiotic is killing uh, by the trillions, the genocide of the, 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 uh, the microbes that are, that are causing your, your infection. Uh, I've said this before, but I think it bears saying again, that objective, uh, objectivity is like a mother who, who, will t who would say, uh, I love all the children of the world just as much as I love my child. That mother would be a monster. By the way, we have such a person who's made such a claim, and her name is Hillary Clinton. Uh, she, she spoke to the Methodist women and got a standing ovation when she said that we have long passed the point when, any, when someone speaking of our children or my children was referring to her own children, that we now understand that when we talk about our children and my child, we're talking about the children of the world. So, no, this is not an exaggeration. Such unnatural creatures exist. Since so many whites are childless, I now have changed this example by using it of pet owners. Now, I have a cat, and I'm very attached to my cat. And he's not the biggest cat in the world. Uh, he's not the most beautiful cat in the world. But he is my cat, and he means far more to me than cats I don't know. And so, since so many people are childless, like me, and, and they can't think in terms of being objective toward your own child, you, you can think of the same thing as your pet. If you met somebody and said, this is my cat, or this is my dog, I, and, but I, and I love him, but I love an unknown cat or dog in Hong Kong as much as I love my own cat, you, you would realize I'm talking to somebody with serious mental problems. <laughs> yeah. this, this is a remarkably uh, odd thing. Whites... You know, we get frustrated with our own people, and I, I get very tired of, of white people. When, when you look at them, it's just amazing. I, I use this example also in trying to deprogram people that uh, are self-loathing whites, what, what I call ethnomasochists. And, and that is, and I've used this example again, but it's one that I urge you to repeat with friends, because I think it's a very powerful one. That as today, March 18th, 2012 dawned, and the earth turned on its axis. Uh, the sun came out of the Pacific over, over Siberia, and the dawn came across Russia and Europe, and then to America, Australia. On this day, there will be thousands, and probably tens of thousands of meetings at which white people will gather to try to figure out what they can do to help non-whites. When I say tens of thousands, no, it's not an exaggeration. When you add up all the optimist clubs, Kiwanis clubs, rotary clubs, church groups, government board, corporate diversity boards, all this kind of thing, 
It would be tens of thousands of meetings at which whites were trying to help a rival race. On the same day, it is fair to say that nowhere on the planet is there anywhere a meeting in which yellow people, black people, or brown people are meeting to try to figure out how to help white people. <laughs> this is a startling discrepancy. And it is an example of how profoundly ill our race is, how, how, how caught it is in, in, in a, a psychological problem, a malaise, it's bogged down in. Uh, it is so frustrating that I often tell people now that I'm, I get tired of trying to coax white people in, into choosing life over death. That, that you, know, you, can, you can be transgendered nowadays. Well, there are times I think I would like to be transraced where, where I could be a, a, I could join a healthy race, that I could actually become a black person uh, or a member of one of these other groups, where I could actually live with people who care about their own people, care about their children, care about their future, instead of living among all these strange zombies, the, the living dead uh, of our own uh, society. It, it's like going hunting. <laughs> It's like going hunting and having to carry the dog. I mean, you know, when, you, when you try to deal with white people. Well, we could go on and on exchanging stories of, of what is wrong with our race, but for all of its faults, it remains our own, as Jared said about his, the, our Confederate ancestors. What then of the solution? Uh, if whites are the problem, the, the patient on the couch, uh, we are the solution. Uh, people like those gathered in this room today are the bearers of the, of the solution to these problems. Uh, and we should not lose sight of that fact. I think in some way, in the back of a lot of people's minds, is the idea that we are doing something a little evil, that we're like the naughty child acting up in the eighth grade who's going to put the frog in the teacher's uh, handbag or something. You know, no, we are, we are the grown-ups. We are the people... Who, who would bring a healthy and normal uh, society. We are the answer to what our people need. And we should have a healthy self-respect for ourselves, uh, as, as I'm sure we do. I, I respect all of you who had the courage, uh, in spite of these groups that try to destroy you financially, that try to strangle you, that even physically assault you, the, the, the 150 or so people who have come to this meeting uh, are noble people. They're brave people. They're people that care deeply about their society and are willing to look at facts in the face and try to figure out where we are to go uh, from where we are now. Well, what about us? Uh, unlike the multiculturalists, we don't believe in an ideology. Uh, our society is in the grips of an ideology, an ideology for whom facts mean nothing. Uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, the, the, the fact that there is no statistical data to support the idea that mixing the races has done blacks any good. Well, I, I went to college with a fellow who's now a fairly prominent historian. I'm not going to mention his name because he's, he's a nice guy. He's not really a radical leftist. He even thinks he's a conservative and, and, and feels that he is a loyal southerner in his own way. But he is a liberal, a, a sort of a mild uh, Adlai Stevenson type liberal. Uh, and I ran into him, him, I'll call him Billy, that's not his name. I, I ran into Billy several years back, and I, he asked if I still believe the stuff I believed in college, and I said I believed it even more. And, and so we discussed it, and I put it out to him, the lack of any statistics to support the idea of mixing the races. Well, a friend of mine who's in this room today mailed me a copy of a book that he wrote recently. Uh, it's a, a transcript of several speeches that he gave on the subject of race. And he found a way to answer the statistical uh, argument by simply saying that it doesn't matter that there aren't any statistics. We, we, have, we have to do this because it makes black people feel good. Uh, and it, it does, that, that's why it's worth it. If it makes them feel good, and if it might lead blacks to feel they're southerners, then it's worth pursuing regardless of the fact that it doesn't have any measurable benefits. So they can answer this argument. <laughs> unlike, unlike people in the grips of an ideology, uh, we base our 
policies and proposals, what we think about the world, how the world functions, our worldview, as the Germans call it, we base those not upon theory. We base them upon experience, upon human experience. And we base them upon facts, not upon dreams. We're not interested in living the dream. Uh, reality is enough for us. Contrary to what they say, we are not extremists. Uh, this is one of the many labels they throw around. You, they, they are extremists. We are not extremists. We are radicals in the sense of that word. Uh, a radical is someone who gets to the root of the problem. You even say radical surgery when you have to cut the tumor out. Uh, we are radicals. We want solutions that go to the root of the problem uh, and not things that, are, that are, are, are plastic surgery to give it a better face. We are also, and, and this is really, I think, one of the, what I would call the core of my remarks today, we are most emphatically not conservatives. Uh, I would like to purge from our vocabulary the word conservative. Uh, I would like to go to a meeting and never hear the word conservative and never hear the word right wing or right. The, the whole idea of right and left uh, is, was from the very beginning an artificial construct uh, out of the French Revolution, where the monarchists sat to the right of the speaker and the Republicans and leftists, and eventually the uh, Jacobins, sat to the left of the speaker. Uh, it is now even more uh, artificial. Uh, it has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. And like Nietzsche said in his, his book, Beyond Good and Evil, we need to move beyond right and left. <coughs> If you look at it, at it in the most superficial way, at right and left in American society, uh, we, it, it, these <laughs> positions are, are completely contradictory and mostly meaningless. Most of the things they argue about are meaningless. Uh, the set of positions that supposedly make you a conservative or make you a liberal are meaningless. Uh, as Paul Gottfried <laughs> pointed out in his cleverest column, uh, belief clusters, uh, America has been artificially divided into blue states and red states based upon a, a, a set of beliefs that have no organizing principle within them. Uh, and by that he means, that let's run over the, the issues that mark a conservative from a liberal. We have, we have abortion. Uh, we have uh, gay rights. Uh, we have uh, immigration. We have repeal of the capital gains tax, or whether it should be increased, repeal of the estate tax, uh, gun laws, uh, and so on and so on. When you think about it, your position on immigration really doesn't inform, shouldn't inform anything about your belief on gun control. You, you could be uh, opposed to immigration, uh, as liberal Dutch people are, and say that, you know, we don't want guns. Uh, you could be, and what you think about gay rights, you know, you could be for immigration and, and against gay rights or against gay rights. You know, none of these issues have any organizing principle. They're, they're simply an artificial division of people, of white people is what we're concerned about, uh, into these artificial groups. Uh, I think, uh, without romanticizing liberals, because I, I have lived much of my life being attacked by people who call themselves liberals, in some ways, we have more in common with liberals than we do with conservatives. Uh, and that is that, like liberals, I think, we put the common good ahead of individual self-interest. Uh, in our proposed utopian state, private property rights would be subordinate to the health of the race. Uh, in the old Roman sense, as a salus populi lex suprema, that the health of the people is the supreme law, uh, or as Jews are reputed to say, in evaluating any issue, is it good for the Jewish people? This should be our guiding light. Uh, we should not be wed to issues of libertarianism and private property. If you think about it, we are, we are able to have this meeting to get today because of big government. Private enterprise will not let us have a meeting. So I, I ask all of you to re-examine bracketing yourself with libertarians 
Most of these conservative groups are, are vehemently opposed to us. The anti-abortionists despise us, and they lace their propaganda with attacks upon eugenicists like Dr. Lin, uh, upon den bizarre denunciations of Hitler and equating uh, people who, who don't want the retarded to have 20 children uh, with, with, with people who supposedly killed millions of people in gas chambers. These people do not like us. We, we are not in a common tent with those who are against abortion. And by the way, I'm not, not in favor of abortion. Uh, but we need to open ourselves to the left. We need to remove ourselves from being a subset uh, of, of a subset of white people. We are not 5% uh, of the conservative movement. We are the white race. We are our entire people. Our solution for these problems uh, as I think, at least my solution, is the ethnostate. And I have spoken about this several times before, and I will do so again. I would like to see a state for my people on the North American continent filled with people who are of my race and of my culture. Uh, a state that necessarily will exclude those who are not of my race and who are not of my culture. A state that will have no obligation to admit Somalis, uh, no obligation to admit Shiite Muslims, uh, no obligation uh, to fill the population with people who will bring only trouble uh, and who cannot possibly share my culture and my race and my religion with me. Contrary to what people would say, oh, this is an extremist proposal, it's a modest proposal. It simply asks for what we had 50 years ago. Uh, we asked for it in a better, more perfect, more explicit form. We are only asking for what the Jews have been accorded in Israel. Uh, the most remarkable triumph uh, of racial idealism in the history of mankind, uh, in which a nation that had been dead for 19 centuries uh, was revived and an extinct language made the language of a society. Millions of people learned an extinct language and recreated it as a living language. Uh, this is the most remarkable example of racial idealism in the history of our people, of, of the people of the world. Uh, nothing like it has ever happened. It'd be like the Irish going back to Galicia or something and recreating Gaelic, ancient Gaelic at that, uh, and making it the lingua franca of, of six million Irish people who'd returned to uh, Galicia and Spain where they came from. You know, it, it is, it is a remarkable thing. And, the, and I like to use this example because the very people like the Clintons and, and the others who would be furious at the suggestion of a white ethnostate are firmly in support of a Jewish ethnostate. Uh, and you can't have it both ways. Uh, either the Jews are entitled to their own country uh, and we are entitled to our own country, or neither of us is entitled to our own country. Uh, in which case, if Hillary Clinton and Obama were, were consistent, uh, we would be bombing Israel as we did Serbia and making them import Arabs and give them full citizenship and put them in as generals of their army and put them on the Supreme Court uh, and that kind of thing. So it is a modest proposal. It simply asks for reciprocity, which is the basis, the, the very foundation of, of, of social discourse. You know, if I say good morning to you at, at the workplace and you never say good morning back, just that little lack of reciprocity creates tension. You know, you, 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 it, if, I say th if you say thank you to me and I don't say you're welcome, just that level of a lack of reciprocity creates tension. What more dramatic lack of reciprocity can there be uh, in the government of the United States denying us our state and telling us it is, it is like immoral and even a crime uh, to seek our own state? but then demanding recognition of the state of Israel and funding uh, a, a, an ethnic state. There is no consistency there. So it's a modest proposal. We as Euro-Zionists are simply asking for our own ethnostate. What would an ethnostate be like? Well, it would be inclusive. Uh, it would be tolerant. Contrary to liberal claims, and all right, there I go again. See, it's hard to escape the trap. Co contrary to the claims of our opponents, Multiculturalism and, and a proposition nation do not walk hand in hand with tolerance. 
Britain in the 1800s could be a tolerant society. It could have Gallic-speaking uh, Scots, it could have Scottish Presbyterians, it could have Anglicans, it could have Roman Catholics, it could have atheists, because they were all considered part of the family. And, and you, can, you see that when you read the, wall, the novels of Sir Walter Scott. All the characters are part of society, from uh, a Roman Catholic like, like uh, Mary Queen of Scots to John Knox, uh, the Protestant uh, reformer. They're all part of the community. That's the way an ethnostate works. It's inclusive. It includes people of all social classes, includes vegetarians, includes alcoholics, it includes heterosexuals, it includes homosexuals. It is a society that includes a people. When a country becomes a creedal nation, when it becomes a proposition state, it by definition is an intolerant nation. You and I are, are truly un-American. They are right when they say you are un-American. It doesn't matter that your ancestor uh, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence or my ancestor, Andrew Pickens, was a general in the Revolution. We, we, that doesn't matter. The fact that you were the genetic substance that created the New England uh, does not matter, and in fact is actually a detriment in the society we live in. What matters is that you believe in their program. And so since they now run our country, from an objective point of view, we are not citizens of the United States, just as a Russian Orthodox Christian was not a Soviet person. And in so under the proposition nation's laws, the Soviet Union, such people were called non-Soviet people. They were not part of the nation. So tolerance is part of our program, not theirs. What would an ethnostate bring? I know I'm running out of time, but I'll, I want to summarize, if I may, the, some of the things that we would see. One thing you would see is we would return to the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant foreign policy of this country which is, historically, a combination of George Washington's admonition to stay out of foreign quarrels, coupled with President Monroe's proposition that you prevent any other nation from getting bases near the United States, which would allow us to live on our side of the world, serene, at peace, not involved in wars, and not the subject of terrorist attacks. Contrary to what we're told, I believe if you leave people alone, they will pretty much leave you alone. Uh, we had a modus vivendi of living with Muslims, and that was they were on their side of the Mediterranean and we were on ours. Now our government, not merely ours, but the European governments, pursue a policy of bomb the world, invite the world, as somebody else said, I forget who. We bomb them, we kill their children, we blow up the school buses, all by accident, and probably it is true by accident. And then once you enrage these people, you move them in next door. <laughs> I mean, this would not happen in our ethnostate. Uh, we would not be involved in these foreign quarrels. We would not be the subject of, of, of terrorist attacks. Uh, we would be a nation at peace. It would be a society in which we would have a scientific form of humanism, not the libertarian dog, -eat -dog society that so many people on the right want, uh, because our society would include poor people, retarded people, geniuses of all sorts. But we would apply, we would follow the principles of science uh, in, our in, in our humanitarian programs. We would take care of the poor, but we would control their breeding. Uh, we would, as Dr. Lin said yesterday, encourage geniuses to reproduce. Uh, we would, over a period of generations, have a, pro a policy, a, a, a social purpose of restoring to our race the IQ that it had in antiquity, at the time of Periclean Athens, an average IQ of 120, uh, which I think could be done. Uh, we would have a cooperative society like that of Switzerland, uh, in which uh, ethnic tensions would diminish because you would no longer have programs to tell people about, to pick at the scabs and tell them of all the problems. You know, the liberals like this do this even, or most especially among our own groups, you know, that, that they want to go and tell the Irish how awful Cromwell was. They want to come tell the Presbyterians how bad the IRA is. You know, they like to keep these groups fighting among our own people. We would see ourselves uh, like the, the ancient uh, Greeks did, we would have like, like pan-Hellenism. -Hellen we would be pan-Europeans. We would remain our own citizens of our own state, but we would understand that there would be a difference between a Russian or a Frenchman or an Englishman 
uh, and, and a Somali that even though they weren't in our state and they would have their own societies that would follow their own cultures, there would be an overarching racial and cultural and religious unity that would bind us together. Um, th this is what society would be like. Uh, and it would be a, gr a wonderful society. It would be a society that would offer the prospect uh, of greater than ever triumphs of civilization and the elimination of inherited diseases, the, the elevation of the cultural level of, of mankind, and, and, but most especially of our own people. These are the stakes of the struggle that we are in. Uh, it is that vision versus a vision of Calcutta or Tijuana. Those are the stakes. And yes, I understand why people get discouraged, and I get discouraged too, like I was saying, and, and sometimes I want to be transraced, uh, to get out of these sick white people. But the stakes of this struggle are so enormous. They are the most enormous stakes in human history. And if you are ever tempted to give way to despair or to calculate all the odds against us and the cost to you, uh, of, your, you know, of your involvement uh, in this struggle, uh, I ask you to consider the stakes and to realize that this struggle is indeed worth it. In fact, it is the only struggle worth pursuing at this time on our planet. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk uh, and a great ovation from uh, the audience. Sam, I completely agree with you that the conservative movement and, and liberalism are, the, are social constructions, so to speak. And, that, and I also agree with you that we shouldn't, that piggybacking on the conservative movement, A, fails. The conservative movement is a immune system for racialism and anyone who kind of questions the establishment. So I, I think that's a good thing. But there is a left and a right. And if you look at the left throughout history, it's something it's, uh, it can continually reform itself, it's something that will you know, latch onto the working class and then dump the working class and look to the wretch of the earth. It's an, it's an amazing thing, and I think it is a real thing. Um, I, and, and also, you can kind of look at right and left in terms of um, just basic ideas. I think the right might actually be collectivist in the sense that you think that you come from someone. You come from somewhere. Nothing can come, something always comes, nothing can come from something. Or so, so, sorry, it's a little early. <laughs> but, you, you sound like the sound of music. <laughs> nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever right. did. <laughs> right. right, you need, uh, you need something for something. And I think in some ways the left is a kind of, they're or vision as a kind of atomistic world uh, where you can make all your preferences and so on and so forth. So I really think that there are two, at, at or level, two real basic worldviews. And, and I guess maybe I think our challenge is to how do we channel that leftism. There, there seems to be some people who, for whom all those things that I just said are deeply meaningful, like this Coney 2012. I mean, when I looked at that, I wanted to throw up or throw my computer against the wall, because I, 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 my instincts that I'm born with, I, I detest that kind of stuff. I, I like hierarchy and I like heroism. There are some people on earth for whom this sappy, saccharine nonsense just fills them with joy, and, and a lot of them, you know, uh, are filled up with, you know, they go to Christian churches, they go to leftist meetings, they, so on and so forth, but, but don't you think this is actually, the left is actually a part of us? Well, it, I, I think that the sappiness you're talking about pervades left, the quote left, end quote, and the quote right, end quote. Uh, when you listen to Sarah Palin carry on to a Tea Party meeting, uh, it, it is something that is so remote from us. I, I heard her speak one time on television, and in the first seven minutes of her speech to these rip-roaring, cheering crowds, she said that when the Republicans defeated Obama, there were four things they were going to do. They were going to balance the budget, cut taxes, rebuild our anemic military that only has a budget equal to that of every military in the, United, in the entire globe, and go to war with Iran. 
Now, now someone who says that is certifiably mad, and, and, so, and the people who cheered that are certifiably mad. You missed them. She was on Sean Hannity. She said, when, when they had this Derek Bell controversy, she said, Obama brings us back to the America before the Civil War, when race mattered. Yeah. Well, we, we have nothing in common with these people. And as for liberals, I, I, I deal a lot with liberals, and, and, you know, and, and or so-called liberals. People think of themselves as liberals. And, and I have found in dealing with them that so long as our, our ideas doesn't have a return address on them, a lot of them are open. In fact, a lot of them are, are actually thinking. Uh, you know, I, I've talked to a very liberal doctor some months ago. He, on his own, brought up the problem of the downbreeding of the human race. So this is somebody that if, you, if you'd come to him and say, well, I'm from, I'm from the right to life, uh, say, preserve the family, um, you know, Veterans of Foreign War Committee, the, the shades would just come right down. Uh, so we got to get beyond right and left. Yeah, we, we have to. And the, and the left wasn't always what it is today. You know, remember, Margaret Sanger was a leftist, um, you know, who believed in eugenics. Uh, the people who, who worked for peace in World War I, uh, the, the isolationists, most of them were, liberal, were more what we consider liberals than they were conservatives. Uh, and that's even true of World War II. People forget Norman Thomas was on the board of directors. The socialist candidate for president of the United States was on the board of directors of the America First Committee. Uh, and so we have walled ourselves off into our own little ghetto. And I do not want to be a subset uh, of the right-wing ghetto. And I'm not interested in any of these issues that excite right-wingers. They're just irrelevant to me. They're relevant to us. And we need to be, as adult people, we, we are not on the left. As ra racial idealists, we are not on the left, we're not on the right, and we're not in the center. We're above. Yes, our, our Harvard-educated lawyer. Sam, it, um, it seems to me that we're in this predicament not really because of a loss of IQ points, but because of a loss of courage. And um, I'd just be interested to, to get your thoughts on, in the future, what can we do? And maybe it's genetic, or maybe it's cultural, or maybe it's a mix of both, but what can we do to prevent this society of cowards um, from once again prevailing and allowing what's happened to us to happen again. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, I wish I could give you a solution, Joe. Um, you yourself are a gutsy guy, and you're a hard educated lawyer who's willing to associate with us. That, that's a really amazing thing. Uh, it, it wouldn't have been amazing 100 years ago, uh, but it's amazing now. I, can't, I, can't, I have difficulty getting, getting lawyers to even represent me. They're, they're so afraid. They won't even consult with me. They're so terrified when they read the Internet. They're, they're terrified. The, uh, you're absolutely right, and I'm glad you asked that question, because it's a point of disagreement between me and Alex Kurtajik. As important as I think it is that we have a moral case for our cause, I really don't think that these people are signing up uh, or, or standing firm for the other, other cause, uh, the cause of white genocide, because they've, they've been convinced by a moral case. It's, it's like, a, like the question I asked uh, when he spoke. The, these lawyers that I talk to who, are, who want to talk about what Jesus would do about immigration and how immoral our views on immigration are, Jesus just doesn't come into play when it comes time to support their own children and pay their child support payments. I think that the moral thing is merely a mask for cowardice. It allows a coward to say, I'm a conscientious objector, when the truth is, he's afraid to fight. And how you, how do you give, you know, like in the uh, like in uh, The Wizard of Oz, you know, how, how do you give somebody a heart that doesn't have a heart or give, give them a backbone that doesn't have a backbone? I don't know. I think one of the problems we have is that historically Western civilization has been saved by people who came from a military aristocracy like Charles Martel, like the English aristocracy. The, the English aristocracy carved out most of the ideas of, of our English law, our Anglo Saxon law system, the, the right to habeas corpus. It, it was the barons who bore arms against King John who got the Magna Carta. Uh, it was people like that. As I look at history, businessmen and merchants have, have very rarely been the heroes that won battles like that. Uh, we do not have in this country much anymore a military aristocracy. We are a nation of shopkeepers, as the Germans derided the English uh, in the two world wars. Businessmen, and here's another thing where conservatives don't get it. 
They confuse aristocrats with plutocrats. A plutocrat is an entirely different thing from an aristocrat. Because you have money does not mean you're a, you're a conservative or you're a custodian of the ancient rights of our people. Businessmen get money by pleasing people, by putting the little happy face in the McDonald wrapper. And, and when they have a customer like American Renaissance trying to rent their hotel and they're going to get some flack, they are not like the military aristocracy. They, they are not indifferent to public opinion. The, the, the business community will please people. And people like that don't have balls. They don't have backbone. Uh, you know, how you restore manliness to an effeminate, whipped down, eager to please race, I don't know. But we'll have to find a way to do it. And one way is, when we create our new ethno state, there have to be <coughs> categories of citizenship. Uh, and there are certain people we need to, we need to think all these things out now before there's a crisis so that we will, we will be ready, just like the government was ready with the Patriot Act. Within 24 hours of the 9-11 bombing, the government had an act that thick on the desk of every congressman's in the, you know, they didn't stay up late typing. They, they had that in a database. They've got gun, I'm not, I don't care about guns, unlike my friend Martin O'Toole, who's a big gun enthusiast who's here. But, you know, good and well, they've got all the gun confiscation laws ready for some kind of dramatic assassination. Somebody shoots the Pope or something. That will be on every desk within 24 hours of some emotional assassination. We have to have our own plans in place. Uh, and, one of the, and we need to think, 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 think things through. What kind of person qualifies for the most basic level of citizenship in our society? What kind of person has forfeited forever their right to live in our racial state? I, I do not want someone like Hillary Clinton saying, well, like, like she tried to do against Obama when she tried to play the race card. Hey, I'm white too. Hey, now I'm here. Can I be your sexual state? People like this who have dined out their entire lives by being racial renegades and rank makers, they need to, be, and their genes need to be removed from our state. They should be allowed to live their philosophy. Yeah. Hillary, Hillary, Hillary and those who like her, like her who claim they believe in multicultural and diversity, there's a place for them. It's called Port-au-Prince, and that's where she needs to live. Anyway. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, really, this conference happened because of you, and I can't thank you enough. And uh, this brings our proceedings to an end, and I look forward to seeing all of you at the next American Race. Thank you very much. <laughs>